our business. All right, um, so as I asked you a second ago, you know, last week was the first piece of the armor that we discussed, which was the uh, girdle of truth there in Ephesians um, chapter 6, the chapter uh, of spiritual warfare, where Paul's addressing the church of Ephesus about spiritual warfare and how to conquer it or beat it rather if you will and succeed doing so um, and that's why I wanted to start this off with um, teaching y'all uh, we have a we have a revenue a way to succeed and conquer uh, because as new believers or babes in Christ even those who are elders still have not gotten this very crucial part of the Bible on how to succeed in being a godly, God-fearing, God-loving, God-succeeding Christian. And we've got armor. Um, any soldier that goes into battle, as you know, has armor. He's suited up from his head to his feet. He's got special boots. He's got special pants, special gear up top, uh, you know, um, helmet to protect his head. He's got his sword of the spirit, of course, would be his rifle. Um, he's protected, and he's he is equipped and designed and trained to go into war and fight uh, and succeed and live or else the unthinkable, as like in the sermon I'm preaching this morning, 400 to 1, um, die. Now, the death you'll experience here, Jacob, is spiritual death. And um, I've known many Christians who were strong going in but didn't last very long, uh, didn't succeed, got overwhelmed with the world, the, their flesh or the devil, and failed, brother, failed horribly. I, I remember when I failed, my first go around, when I, I was strong, man. I had, a, I had a pastor, Brother Randy Reese, who was the, my mentor for 15 years once I got serious about it. And, you know, that's the thing, Jacob. If you don't take this serious... Sin ain't serious, no beeswax here, I'm the real deal. You're never going to make it. As I've said, and I'll continue to say, you will get out of this what you put in it. And if you're not suiting up with the armor daily, brother, especially, uh, you know, when you're with your girlfriend, you're going to fail, brother, horribly. And then, of course, after we fail, who's there to make us feel great about it? The devil. He wants you to feel like uh, you did it now. You're done. Just like Wednesday night's uh, sermon that I preached in my bedroom at the house on uh, uh, temptation. Uh, if you hadn't listened to it, I challenge you to listen to it with your girlfriend. Um, Sister Joe, I posted it. It's on there, and I'm telling you, in that little room with me and Tucker, my dog, son, the spirit was moving. And I was able to give a message out about temptation, and I had just uh, experienced that with my one with somebody I love dearly and you know they were going through they were going through a hard temptation the one area in this young man's life that the devil knows he struggles and I took him to that passage 1 Corinthians 10 13 and I broke it down for him just like I did in the sermon and uh, he was so thankful and so grateful and he made it through that night so we've got everything we need right here as Jesus defeated the devil in the uh, wilderness there with the three temptations, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, he pulled it straight from the Bible. So this Bible is a briefcase, if you will, full of daggers for up close and personal battle when the enemy gets personal with you because that's how he defeats us. He uses the outside influence. If that don't work, he goes to the inner man, the old man, the person you used to be before you got saved and tries to make him come back to life, bring him up out of that grave. When you were baptized, you laid down the old person and come up as the new in Christ Jesus. That's what death, burial, and resurrection, that's what baptism represents. So I ask you, did you have to use the girdle of truth this week? And you said yes. How was that? It helped out a lot. It's crucial. 
truth. No, but when you do express the truth, uh, little brother, do it in a loving, kind way, not as a judgmental or I know more than you know way, but as, let me put you, when, when I try to share the truth with somebody uh, and listen, it, it can turn into a heated battle. Um, but when you're being truthful with someone, you know, I've always said this, and being in supervision, if you ever are, you'll learn this. It's however the message is given is how it's going to be received. If you come in authoritative or judgmental, that's how it's going to be received. But if you come in with kind, soft-spoken words and as a example, not an execution, then it will be perceived and received a whole lot better. Amen? And it's not easy being truthful with ourselves. You know, we have to be, before we can be even begin to be truthful with others, and this is what I was uh, teaching on last uh, Sunday, uh, you have to be truthful with yourself. Can you go up to somebody, Jacob, you've put on the girdle of truth this morning, and can you go up to somebody with your hand on your belt because I'm going to be truthful today. I'm going to tell the truth because I know the truth and I'm living the truth. And you go up to somebody can you honestly go up to somebody and tell them something about they're doing wrong and tell them the truth if you're not doing it yourself? No. You are a false teacher. Or if you do that. You cannot spiritually walk up to somebody and express the truth because you've put on that piece of armor this morning and express it full-heartedly if you're not living it yourself. And that's what Paul said. It's not just you know the truth. Paul says we are the truth and we are to live the truth. Everything we do, and I'm going to tell you something, little brother, that's hard. Is it not? Uh, when God points out something in your life, you know you're walking high and, 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 uh, and mighty, you're on cloud 11, rung 10 of the ladder, and all of a sudden Jesus points out something in your life. You, you're not being truthful here. You know, well, wait a minute, Lord, I've got the girdle of truth. Oh, yeah, you do. And when I look at you, I see my son. But I also see within you something that's not of my son. And I want you to change it. And in order for you to tell somebody else they can't or they shouldn't or they you wouldn't, how can you be that person unless you truly are truthful? And that's why this piece of armor is so critical because... You know, living the truth is one thing. Walking what you talk is an entirely something else. Y'all come on in. We were just recapping on last uh, Sunday, and I asked Jacob, um, Jacob, was there a time this past week that you had to exercise that girdle of truth? And he said, yeah. And he said, it, it worked out, but it wasn't easy. Uh, it's never easy when you have to be truthful with somebody. Um, but as I expressed with Jacob, uh, Special K, Mr. T, when you approach somebody to tell them uh, what they should do or what they shouldn't do because you've strapped on that girdle that morning, the girdle of truth, can you really approach them if you're not truthful yourself? In other words, we have a bad habit as a human race on judging, especially Christians. You want to be judged? Come to church. Can I get an amen? Yes, you want somebody to judge you, come in God's sanctuary, because I guarantee you there's plenty there waiting to do it. Mm -hmm. But in order for us to be truthful with others, do we not have to be truthful with ourselves? Mm -hmm. So was there a time, Mr. T, this week that you had to exercise truthfulness? Oh, yeah. You know, I was thinking about you this week, little brother, because, I, you know, I work on stuff. And by the way, I got... I redid the entire exhaust, saved it, and it's in my, I put it in Friday. Oh. So on my truck that I've done wrong the first time, uh, horribly wrong. Okay. But anyway, when I was thinking about this, because you work in automotive mechanics, right? Yes, sir. And so you probably work for a, a company, mm -hmm. right? Yes, sir. So let me, I thought about you. I think about y'all a lot. And um, I was thinking, Lord, what, what, is, what is my little brother doing? This week, and I know I, I gave him the first piece of armor that we're to put on is the girdle of truth, and he diagnoses a vehicle on what's wrong with it. But you find, you know, the, the owner says, "Well, well, just we'll just we'll fix that, but we're going to tell him it was something else." And and he walks.
walks away. Now, him being the owner, he has the right to do that. But how does that make you feel? It's not honest. It's not truthful. And you know it's not. It makes you want to run out there and get to the customer before he does and say, he's fixing to lie to you, but here's what I really found. Yeah. But once you have, and I thought, in, in your defense, once you've given the truth to him, what it really was, it's on him. Exactly. Whatever he decides to do, Mr. T, is on him, not you. So never, ever walk away from telling the truth, feeling defeated, because that's the wrong emotion. That's the enemy trying to convince you you were wrong. Exactly. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. What about you, Special K? Okay. Did you have to use it this week? Mm-hmm. Well, maybe with somebody you loved or cared about. Um, you know we're hated, right? We are. We're hated. I, I, I try to stress this to Christians. They can't understand why nobody accepts us. It's because we're truthful. And not only are we truthful, we walk what we talk. If you're not walking it, don't talk it. Exactly. Don't. Because you're a false teacher or a false preacher when you do so far. And I'm going to tell you something. The judgment for that is harsh. You're a hypocrite. And that's the favorite word in the church language, hypocrite. How many times have you been called a hypocrite? Or if you ever have, raise your hand. Amen. Who are you? I know who you used to be. I know how you used to act. Special K, you know where I'm going with that. That's going to be their number one defense on us. I, like uh, Me and her kind of had the same background. Um, I did drugs. I drank. I partied. Uh, if, you know, if, if, if there wasn't a party happening, I'd make one happen. Um, and then when you, you walk up to somebody and, and you tell them about Jesus, whoa, really? You're, you're, you're a preacher. I, I actually was at a, a party, a company party. It wasn't a party party. Of course, there was alcohol there. It was a pool party uh, last, yeah, last year. And uh, run into my first boss that got me into the local, the union. And we were at, around the swimming pool, and and apparently she didn't know I was a preacher. And um, somebody mentioned something, be careful, there's a preacher here. And I always say, listen, you don't have to apologize to me. You need to apologize to the Lord. I have nothing to do with it. But anyway, she's, she's her, and she was always very harsh sometimes. She raised that head up. She said, J.R. ain't no preacher. And I looked her right in the eye, and I said, yes, I am, Dominique. I serve the Lord Jesus Christ, and I preach at East Joint Baptist Church, and I wish Jim Scott might come down one Sunday. And it shut the whole thing down. So sometimes the reason there's a reason why the first piece of armor that Paul mentioned was the girdle of truth. Because if you don't walk what you're talking, the rest of this armor is useless. It, you're not even, it's like putting on aluminum foil instead of cold hard steel. And, you know, you can stick your finger through foil, right? Try putting your finger through a piece of steel, and it'll happen. So in order for you to be armored, you have to be truthful. That was the first piece. And I wanted y'all to really grab hold to that, because if you don't hold on to the truth, then you're going to be a liar or a false prophet, false teacher, false witness. And your, your words will just fall. They won't hit the mark. They'll just fall. Because they're going to look at you and say, you're going to come at me with that, and I know what you do. I've seen it. I lived it. I'm around you. I know who you really are. And you're going to come off as some godly person. Don't bring that my way. You st- and you'll hear this. Until you start walking it, don't talk it. She got a cold. She's always has allergies. Always, she always has. Every time she was born, she's had a word. Well, you're, I'm glad you're in here this morning, beautiful. So we're in Ephesians chapter 6, as y'all know, uh, and we're going over the spiritual armor, verses 10 through 18, and, and we're going to read it, the entire passage, every Sunday, because I, I want y'all to grasp this and hear it, hear it, hear it, because I'm going to give you a card that is how you pray this armor on every day, and it's also a bookmark. You can use it as a bookmark. And keep it with you because every morning put it where you're going to see it because if you don't suit up for battle, you're going to get hit that day. It's coming out of nowhere. You're not going to see it coming. You're not even going to know it's coming. 
So anyway, verses 10 through 18, and may God bless the reading of his word. Amen? Amen. The Bible says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And that means uh, they have a ranking, the demons' angels. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. That means to take or uh, hold up against that in the evil day and having done all to stand. He says stand five times in these two verses. Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth. There it is, the girdle of truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, above all, that's a very important phrase, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, those missiles that are shot at us daily, amen, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all preparation and supplication for all the saints. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you this morning, Lord God, for this class. What a blessing it is to see these young adults willing to give up their time this morning, Lord God, to come and learn about you, to find out, figure out, and fight for what they believe in, and that is you. Now, I pray, Lord God, that you arm them, prep them, Lord Jesus, with the spiritual armor that we're going over this morning. I pray their entire bodies, front and back, is covered. Lord God, put a hedge of thorns around them and their families. Protect them, Lord Jesus. They're here for you. And Lord God, you said in your word, where two or three are gathered, there you are in the midst. So thank you for sitting in on our Sunday class, Sunday school class this morning, Lord. We give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. All right, so we have the girdle of truth. We know that means being truthful. Because we know the truth, living, walking what we talk. Amen? Amen. Now, the next piece that Paul's going to mention, and I love the descript- how, to de- how I describe to y'all this one. The breastplate of righteousness. Now, as you know, Paul was a Roman soldier. That's why every piece of armor he's describing is actually a piece they wore, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, when soldiers would put on breastplates, what is what did those what did the breastplate cover? What what was its purpose? What did it cover? Everything. Yes. That's the key one right there, the heart. You can't live if your heart ain't beating. You get a punctured lung, you can get over that. Liver hit, you can get your liver regenerates. It's the only organ in the Bible that does. You can cut it out and it'll grow back. Uh, you know, a kidney, you can live without a kidney. But when that heart gets hit, it's over. And what I'm preaching on this morning, 400 to 1 is the title. That's what happens. The heart was pierced. Now, what I want you all to understand about this is the breastplate of righteousness. Okay? What does that mean? I want want you all to understand what this piece of armor represents. All right? So, and this is how I describe it. You've got two books, right? And this book, Special K, which I wouldn't want nobody to see, by the way, is The Lives and Times of J.R. Jones. Then there's this book, The Lives and Times of Jesus Christ. When we give our heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, right, Jesus takes the cover off his book and he puts it on our book, So when God looks at us now, he don't see J.R. Jones. He sees his son. That's what it means to be righteous through Christ Jesus. The only way we are righteous is because of Jesus Christ. So thank God, amen, that Jesus took his cover off his book and put it on mine. So now when God looks at me, he doesn't look at me, he sees his son. Because if he saw me, he would smite me dead, amen. So that's what it means to be righteous in Christ Jesus. Now, what does that mean when you put this armor on? What is it, and and Mr. T already quoted what it was, 
What is it that that breastplate protects the most vital organ, and that is your heart? The enemy knows our hearts. God does as well, but so does the devil. And we think with our hearts, do we not? I mean, when somebody says something nice to us, it gives us a, a joy. We, we, we're overwhelmed with joy. But when somebody says something negative or bad about us, I don't go over too well, does it? No. Now, Never. especially if you have a quick temper like I do. Uh, don't, don't, and, and uh, you know, God spoke to me in a mighty way, y'all, this morning, right there in my bedroom when I was doing, going back over the sermon that I was going to preach this morning, and he put a picture up, and he said to me, what about him? This person is my boss. And it is a, and, and you'll hear me quote this in a sermon this morning, did y'all know that it, uh, that it is a natural reaction for us to find somebody who agrees with us rather than opposes us. As a matter of fact, uh, studies have shown that we are twice as likely, twice as likely, to go to someone who does not oppose us, rather who does, because they, that way they agree with what we say and who we are. It's very important to us sometimes to make sure we have our soldiers to back us when we are trying to stress how we feel. You know, your heart is the core of your body, and, and Jesus always referenced the heart. He says, uh, David even, David said, Lord, search my heart and see if you find any inequity within me. David wanted God to search his heart. Have you, are we, are we quick to say that to God? Lord, try, search my heart. I, right here I am. I want you to tell me, Lord, what is it I'm doing wrong or what? I mean, really, seriously. No, no. We push him over, don't we? You know what happens when we do that? We take the cover off our, our book that Jesus put on it, and, and, and there you go. There you go. Because God will not be no part of any sin. Every, our very core, our heart is the final judge, the decision maker in our lives. You chose this beautiful woman because of your heart. She had some effect on your heart. You fell in love with him because of your heart. He had an effect on your emotions. You know that 70 to 80 percent of all Christians has a, an emotional salvation, not a promotional, but an emotional one. They base everything off how they feel. And I've heard many say this. I I ain't going back down there the, to that church. I don't feel the I don't feel the spirit of God. Now, there can be some truth to that, but did you take the spirit of God in with you? Right? I mean, did God go in with you or was you going in there trying to see if God was in there? A lot of people say I don't like that pastor cuz he don't he don't preach what I want to hear. Well, what is it you want to hear? Because technically he's not supposed to be preaching what you want to hear. He's going to preach what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. And, you know, a lot of times, uh, y'all, I know that, and I've even been told sometimes, that, hey, man, you're just too hard. You, you're, you're, your preaching's too hard. And, well, thank you for that. And I hear that a lot. But if you can show me right here in this Bible where Jesus was tickling ears, Show me, please. He said what he meant, and he meant what he said. Now, he did it lovingly, don't get me wrong, but what did he do when he went in the temple and saw that they were exchanging money in the temple? He come unglued on them. The Bible says he even whipped them, turned over the tables and whipped them. Some of them got whipped with a whip. And what, what come out of his mouth? He said, hypocrites, brood of vipers, you have turned my father's house in a prayer into a den of thieves. And he was serious when he said it. But if we're not careful, we will allow our emotions, right? And I guarantee you, one of us this week is going to be hit in this area. Every time I teach or preach on something, somebody gets hit. So you better have your breastplate on this week because that heart's a target. 
And it's the easiest target for the devil because he loves our emotions. He, uh, verse 12 says, for you wrestle not against flesh and blood. Of course you don't. That means we're not wrestling against each other. Remember, we're wrestling against evil spirits that are controlling personalities or attitudes. Now, listen, if y'all think that I don't lose it or I don't blow it and I know it, I I'm here to tell you I do. Because when you're, hey, listen, when your temper is at a 7 and 10 being the top level, it's going to take much to get you there, does it? And you'll fight it, uh, you know, like you'll grit your teeth or you'll walk away or you'll and, and it's still eating you up. If we can learn to control our emotions, I promise you we'll be a better child of God. We will have a promotional salvation instead of an emotional one. It's not about how you feel. Let me tell you all something. The devil don't care how you feel. It is his purpose to make you feel horrible. And if you haven't put that breastplate on, you know, you're walking around, you know, ex 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 exhibiting truth but yet you haven't put that breastplate on, you can have all the truth you want, but if that heart's not in it, son, you're in trouble. You are in trouble. You are. You're not, number one, you're not going to even be telling them what they need to hear. You're going to be telling them what they want to hear because it's based off your emotions. And never, ever say this. Let me tell you what I would do. When somebody asks you for advice, never say, let me tell you what I would do. Because you know what you just did? You did one, two, one of two things there. You took away from them what they was trying to find out. And now you're the spotlight. You took it right off of them. Or you're fixing to give them some information based off how you feel. Now it's probably because it's happened to you before. And you've done something wrong then. And you're fixing to tell them to do something wrong. If we ain't got that breastplate on, our heart's not in the game. I'm just going to be honest with y'all. It's unprotected. It's wide open for the devil to just hit it however he wants to make you act however you used to act. Or maybe even, hey, isn't there sometimes that we just want to say, you know what? For once or every now and then, I got to be myself. I'm going to say what I want to say. I'm going to act how I want. I mean, I, I don't ever do it. I, 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 I'm a Christian, so I'm not allowed to do it. It's not that you're not allowed. You're allowed to do whatever you want. God didn't say you're not allowed. You can't, I'm going to kill you. I'm gonna, you know, he, your will, your free will is the one thing God won't try to go against. Same with salvation. He, he don't, it's not something that you have to do. It's something you choose to do. If you don't choose him, he's not going to force his he don't force himself on nobody. He introduces himself to someone through the Holy Ghost, through whether it be a witness of truthfulness and godliness, righteousness, or he will approach them individually with their heart and he'll put a troublesome spirit on them to where they are drawn to him. But he never, ever forces his way on anybody. He just don't. Would you have loved that man like you do right now, if he would have forced him, forced you to do so. Nor you, her. You know, a lot of mistakes, uh, beloved, that, that a lot of Christians make when they're dating somebody that's not a believer. This is, and, and I have to tell them, I have to really tell them, but they always say the same thing. Well, I, I, I believe I can get them in church. And I believe they'll get saved. I can do it. No, you can't. No. That's right, Special K. If they're not willing to change themselves, there's no way under God's green earth you're going to change that person. Now, your lifestyle could. If you're walking and talking, if you're walking what you're talking and you're living it out before them, but it's very, very dangerous to be unequally yoked. No. It can't. You've got good and evil clashing. And eventually what happens is the evil overtakes the good because they've taken off the breastplate of righteousness and now they're running on emotions. I don't want to lose him. I don't want to let her go. You don't understand. I love her. I love him. Oh, I understand. But is it worth dying spiritually over? Because when you, when you 
reject and set aside your walk, your your relationship with Jesus Christ, you just took him out of the equation and except took evil over him. That's dangerous. That's very dangerous. Let me tell you what ends up happening. They still continue their relationship. They end up getting married. And if you're if they even make it three years, they're divorced. Or they're just they stay and they're living in misery because there's a child involved. Guess who suffers? The child. That child will pay. You will make that person pay through your own child. I've seen it. I've lived it. So it's it's pretty important to put on that breastplate, isn't it? And for the record, the breastplate attaches to the girdle of truth, a soldier's girdle, and the breastplate latches to that truth. What well, makes perfectly sense to me when I read this and I understand it, that in order for me to be found righteous through Christ Jesus, I've got to speak the truth, walk the truth, be the truth, because he was the truth. So they, you see how they latch together now, the breastplate and the uh, girdle? You can't have one without the other so it's nice to me in knowing y'all that I have something protecting my heart and I'm going to tell y'all something if you're an emotional person you really need to understand what it means to strap on that breastplate I mean when you special K you when you throw a child or two or three kids in the mix boy that doesn't that that's, yeah, I mean, it's emotional sometimes, isn't it? Stressful. Yep. Stressful. That's the number one killer, by the way, in the world is heart attacks due to stress. Stress. Why are we walking around so stressed? Don't get me wrong. Hey, life ain't easy. Walking out into that world, you're going into battle every single day. You've got to understand that this is a spiritual war, and evil is at an all-time high right now. You can, you can expose the truth now, and it gets pushed to the side. It's happening every day. You can point out by law that the, the, the things that they did have, have evidence pushed to the side. It all depends on how much money you have. Or who you are, your last name. Remember in school when the rich kids would get in trouble and they pretty much, he just got, they didn't get none of what we got, did they? Because their parents would visit the school and they'd make the comment, you don't, you, you need to be careful because I put a lot of money into this school every, every year. And, and then, so therefore, the principal is going to be like, well, okay, just don't let it happen again. And it, so that it's accepted, right? Mm -hmm. Are we supposed to be accepting anything that we know not be true or wrong? Mm -hmm. But if we're wearing the girdle of truth and we know the truth, right? Mm -hmm. but because we're in the truth. And so when we see a lie, it ought to be very quick and easy to spot. Mm -hmm. Now, what if it interferes with our personal emotions? Remember, in order to be truthful to somebody else, we have to be truthful to ourselves, right? So if you're put on that breastplate, you are saying, I no longer, this isn't me no more, this is Jesus. That's all we're doing here, by the way, is putting on Jesus. Y'all understand that? But when you, when Paul says, um, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, right before that he said, stand and gird yourself with the girdle of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, the truth and righteous. I am found righteous through Christ Jesus. My heart is protected. It's no longer about me. It's no longer about them. It's about him. So every decision we make, because our heart is the ongoer, the pusher of every decision we make, what should we do? Before we make a decision, what should we do? Matthew six thirty three. Mm -hmm. Seek ye first, not second, third, fourth, or last. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all his righteousness and he will direct your path. Well, actually, not only that, it says seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. What things? 
what you're going to him with. If, if, if you see a nice ride on the side of the road for sale, a fixer-upper, because that's usually the ones that hooks me, right? Oh, I can turn that. I can fix it and turn it, right? Make some money. And the outward appearance of this looks great. It looks like it's a quick fix, quick, quick turnaround, right? But then once you get into it, you realize, ooh, wee, there's a lot more wrong here than I thought. Why? Because I judged it by its outward appearance. Don't we do that a lot? Oh, yeah. Judge somebody before we really know what they're going through, who they are, what their life is. We automatically pinpoint them and peg them because we think we're so righteous in Christ Jesus that we can do that. The Bible says, judge not lest you be judged. For whatever measure you judge with, ye also will be judged the same. Right? Now, how would you know so much? How would you know so much about what this person is doing wrong? Can you say that again, Sister K? I didn't hear you. What's that? Yes. In order for us to really pinpoint on what somebody's doing wrong, we are either doing it or we've done it before. So now that we're not doing it, and you know a lot of this, listen, I remember, I remember witnessing to somebody, and they stumped me, y'all, with this question, and it tore me apart because I didn't have an answer. I said, I was explaining to them how we're not supposed to be doing the things like everybody else is doing. We're supposed to be different. Jesus said, you're to be in the world, but not of the world. And, and this person said, well, let me, let me ask you something. How is this fair? How come I can't do those things? Because this was a Christian. He, he was struggling, right? How come I can't do that stuff? But they can do it their whole life. And right at the end of their life, even on their deathbed, they can ask Jesus in their heart and they get to go to heaven. How, how is that fair? Think about that question. You're over here. You can't do what you used to like to do or love to do because you know now that you're walking with Jesus, you got the truth, the righteousness, and you shod your feet with the gospel of peace, and you're a walking upright Christian now. You're not allowed to do that stuff anymore. It's just not allowed. But they are, uh, and they're doing it. Nothing's happening to them, and, and everything's cool with them. They're happy-go-lucky, but you don't really, they're probably not. But anyway, that question stumped me. How is that fair, and why does God allow them in heaven knowing they live like that their entire life? But when I do something wrong, I have to pay for my sins immediately. They get their self, really. But you're right. In the end, God gets them. There's a lifestyle that you choose to live when you become a Christian. It's not something you just immediately decide to do because you don't want to go to hell. Some do, but that's fire insurance, right? But I love the way you just described that. Because Christianity is something you have to want to do. It's not, and it's like she said, it's a, it is a life-changing experience. Uh, God will even come uh, in after you've been in it for a minute and say, hey, whoa, whoa, uh, you need to stop this. And you're like, whoa, whoa, I've been doing it. I see other Christians do it. Why have I got to stop doing it? Because God said that's why. Because apparently he knows down the road this is going to do something more affect somebody in your life and you need to stop it. Right? The two types of sin, omission, commission. Right? Y'all remember how I described those? The sins of omission are the ones uh, out of obedience that you realize you're doing wrong and you just stop doing. Here's the ones that's the hardest for every single Christian, the sins of commission. These are the ones that God says, hey, special K, stop. And that's a command, commission. God commands you to stop doing these over here are easy. We chose, right? We stopped. But the ones God commands us to do, then you've thrown authority in there. And now you know you have to. Over here, hey, man, I've done this on my own free will. But right here, this is something I ain't got no choice in. Can't use. It's where your heart comes in, right? If you're wearing that breastplate of righteousness, you're going to thank God, first of all, for showing you that this was bad. But those sense of commission are the ones we wrestle with the hardest because it's the one God commands us to do. Now you're in a emotional, spiritual battle with yourself. And if you're fighting him, he wins every single time. 
And, and listen, remember, you are the one who chose to give your heart to God. You can't blame him because you have to stop doing things. Because what she said sums up Christianity. It's something you have to choose to do, a lifestyle you have to choose to live, and something you're willing to die for because you choose to do so. Right? So if we've given our heart to God, then we should be willing to let God have our heart. Right? What is the word? And, and I'm going to close with this because we're, we're right here on time almost to quit. What does it take in order for God to cover our hearts, our lives, our families, our entire being? It takes one, it's one word. It takes, it requires something of us. What is that word? Now, remember, you're in war. It does. It does. But what is something your heart has to do? It, yeah, but what is what is something special, K? Uh, and remember, we're in war here, right? Spiritual war. Uh, what does it take? What usually happens? I'll make it simple for y'all. What usually happens when uh, one, one side of the battlefield overpowers the other side of the battlefield? What do they end up usually doing? There's a word. Huh? No. They have, trust me. We are. But what do they do? And they have to do something in order for the other army to know that they're, there's, huh? They do. They do. Come on, y'all. And, and that's what happens. But what has to happen before that can happen? It ta- It's one word. We even got a song about it. I'm, I'm trying to make this easy for y'all. No. Oh, huh? Yeah, it, well, it is kind of trivial, but we, we sang about it. It's it's an altar call song. I can't make this no simpler. Starts with I. And the next word is what we have to do in order for God to really have con- surrender. Surrender. You have, you have to surrender all. Not, not just surrender, Jacob but surrender all. Until we are willing to surrender all, God, there's, God doesn't have all control. And and for the record, I'm telling you, I've been in this for a minute. Go on and do it. Go on and surrender your entire life to God now while you're young. If I, I wish y'all so bad, especially you will with her. You will wish so bad, so bad, that you could go back and do everything different. You wish you could go back, and it's in Scripture. Paul said you can't get back what the locusts eat, but you can keep the locusts from eating anymore, right? So if you if you got this breastplate on, that means you've given God your entire heart. He's there now protecting your entire heart. He's put his, Jesus has put his cover on your book, so when God looks at you now, he sees his son, and there's nothing he wouldn't do for his son. So your heart's protected. But does God own it all? Have you surrendered all? So this week, your homework is going to be asking God to search your heart. Lord, if I'm going to put this breastplate on, I need to know that I'm going to get full protection. I don't want a breastplate of aluminum foil. I want a breastplate of steel. I need total protection. Now, the only way God will give you total protection is if he owns the total of your heart, meaning you've surrendered all. And this is going to be hard. And listen, don't think that when God starts pointing out to us this week things that that he's found within us, don't throw in the towel. Don't think it's too much. The very first thing he puts on your heart, remember, will take care of all the others that falls in behind him. So let's focus on our hearts this week because that's what this breastplate does. It protects our hearts. Because it takes an emotional salvation and makes it promotional. So, so far, are y'all enjoying this class? This is the armor of God we're talking about here. And the only way you're going to win this spiritual war is if you're suited up for battle. If you miss one piece, one, that's where he's coming. Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask, um, Jacob, will you close our Sunday school class, please? Father, thank you for allowing us to gather here today. 
Yes. Amen. Thank y'all for coming this morning. I love and appreciate you.